Uh, welcome to First City. My name is Taryn Howe, and I'm one of the pastors here. We're so grateful to have you here with us this morning. If you're new with us, an extra special welcome to you. We're very glad to have you. Not that we're, I say this, not that we're not glad to have everybody that comes every week, but we're really especially glad to have you. Um, and we're thankful for you. We've been praying for you before we even know you, and we love you already, so we're, we're so glad that you're here. Uh, a couple of things before I just get into the message for today. Uh, we are in the middle of a series, but I just want to say something. Savannah talked a lot about small groups, had a lot of wonderful things. Let me make sure this is in the right spot, because if it's not, that's probably my fault. Thank you, Sean. A uh, couple things about small groups. Small groups start next week. Uh, we have the fair downstairs, so you can go and meet small group leaders and get in a small group. Our small group semester goes for 13 weeks, so it's great to kind of try it out, and if you are not the biggest fan of that small group, there's an ending period, so that's nice too, right? That's not, come on, we all know, it's good to have an entrance and an ending, to a, good to have a season for things. But I wanna encourage every single person to get into a small group. It's one of the best things that we do here. On Sunday morning, just coming Sunday morning, if that's all you're here, it's hard to get to know people. You can come for a lot of Sunday mornings and still feel not really connected to the church body because you don't see anybody any other time in the week and this is all kind of programmed out, if you will. There's not a lot of time for you to talk. I do most of it, I'm sorry. But I, you know that, that's just how it works and so we want to set this up for you to come. Small groups are the best place to do this. Now I wanna point out two small groups. I try not to talk about small groups in particular up here because I don't wanna show favoritism to one, but there are two small groups that we have that are a little just different and they don't, they're not really the, a, a small group in the small group sense where you get in and share your life together completely and are in a study. These are just a little different. Families Count is one of them. It got a, a little shout out this morning uh, already, but Families Count is really a class that we offer to the community for families that are going through a difficult situation. A lot of them have had DCF involved in that. And so if you join the Families Count small group, this is really a service-oriented group. You are joining to serve. Not that there's not a small group component of it, but just, just know it's a little different. If you're looking for an outreach small group, this is the one you need to get involved in. I would, look, we got some amens, some yeses, a hallelujah here and there. Um, this Families count, I, I really cannot state how incredible it has affected our whole church body and the lives of some of the people, not only that have attended the class, but have helped to make the class happen. And so if you're not sure where to go, this is a great group to join. The other one I wanna talk about is a, a, not really a small group, but it's a class that's gonna take place. So I, I met with a, a a couple that's started coming here, and the husband, Dr. Eric Waller, has started coming here, and I'm calling him Dr. Waller here. He would probably, he doesn't really care to call that, but you can call him Eric, but uh, Dr. Waller, we're gonna be very formal in this moment. I, I went to him about six months ago uh, when they started coming here. Do I need to do something different, Sean? No, okay, just let me know if I need to. Yell at me or throw something if you need to. Sean, not everybody else, uh, but. <laughs> I went to Dr. Waller and I asked him, he, he just got done teaching a, a class at a collegiate level in India, teaching the book of Galatians in the Bible, an expository look at the book of Galatians in the Greek. Yeah, okay, so if you're thinking, well, he had to teach people who speak a different language about a different language than English, because he's teaching Greek. Like he, that, it takes somebody who has a certain level of knowledge and he has it. And I went to him and said, Hey, I, I need something from you because he asked how he could serve and benefit the church. I said, this is what I would like for you to do. If I could just like have my dream here, it would be for you to teach almost a systematic theology, which those are fancy words, but it just means how to look at the Bible basically and have a deeper understanding of the Bible. And he has agreed. So he has three different classes that he's teaching. These are not really small groups. It's not really a come in and share your life and this is what's going on with me and how are you. This is a come in and dive deep into the Bible, into the word of God from somebody who knows it better than I do. I mean, this is a guy that I, I, when I have a 
problem and I'm reading scripture because we all should be wrestling with scripture in some ways and I get to something and I think, ah, I'm not really sure. I, you know, different commentaries are saying different things. I'd like another opinion. I have gotten his opinion before to help with a sermon. Um, a very brilliant man, God has gifted him. He would not want to say this about himself, so I will. So I just want to encourage you uh, because on Sunday morning in here, there are people here who have never read the Bible and we are so glad you are here but this is not the time to talk about, you know, Arminianism versus Calvinism versus, you know, transubstantiation. All these words that don't, we don't really, you know, are like big words and it's like, what is going on here? And so if you need, if you want that deeper dive and you're just looking to learn more from somebody who really knows it, just wanna encourage you in that, but no, it's a class, not really a small group, but go prepared to learn and study and maybe have some homework or something. I think you should give homework, Dr. Wallet. There, I see him back here. You should give some homework, okay? That'd be good. But I just wanted to point those out because they're very different than what we're doing. Now, here, if you go to any of our small groups, I think that's a great step in the right direction. Any of them. We've got fantastic, fantastic small groups. So please, please, please get involved in one. Okay, I wanna get into what we're talking about today. Before I say anything about it though, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day and I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for Taylor and for Sharon and what we witnessed this morning. God, we wanna see a baptism every week. We wanna see one every day, Lord. We, we love to rejoice in that. Thank you for that life decision. I pray that you would empower Taylor with your Holy Spirit and fill her with your Holy Spirit to speak the message of Jesus to her friends, to her family, to her enemies even, Lord, that they would come to know you, Jesus. I pray that you'd give me the words to say this morning so that each person not hears what I am saying but hears what you want them to hear and that you would speak to all of our hearts and minds. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we're in the middle of a series called Who's Your One? To sum up what this is about, we've, we're in the third week. We have asked every person from middle school and up to uh, find a person, pick a person, choose one person to write their name down. We're gonna pray over that person every day. You're going to pray over that person every day. We'll have other people praying with you, but you're gonna pray over that person every day. And then with the intent that you are going to go to them, and I'll just call it and share kind of a next step with them. Maybe the next step for them is to, you, you need to just go and share Jesus, like share the good news of Jesus, share your testimony with them. Maybe you think the next step is for them to come to church. I'm gonna let you and the Holy Spirit work on that because I don't wanna interfere with what the Holy Spirit's doing, but your goal is to take a next step with them so that they will come to know the Lord. The, we got to see this this morning. And, and here's what we're talking about now is we're talking about some different conversion stories that we, we see in the book of Acts. And we started last week with the Ethiopian eunuch in chapter eight. Today we're in chapter nine because all I really want us to do is learn from these stories what we can learn about conversion. And, and give us some, some clue and some help and some hints on how to do this. Because some people are really good at this and some of us are not good at this. That's okay. We're gonna learn how to do better and we're going to do better at it. Uh, Sharon, she does not know I'm gonna say this. And so, sorry Sharon if I'm embarrassing, embarrassing you at all. Sharon is the, who baptized Taylor this morning. I just want you to know, Sharon, just a incredibly godly woman who uses what she has to serve the Lord in incredible ways. She is sharing, it seems like Sharon, you know, she's sharing Jesus with everybody. She's a hairdresser and so what I think she does is she gets people halfway through a haircut. <laughs> oh yeah. She's pointing at people who she's done that to. Yeah, there you go. She's like, well, I've got this dye in now, so let me tell you about Jesus, okay? And then it's like, oh, you wanna leave? Okay, yeah, well, there you go. Don't really get an opportunity for that. No, but she is, she is constantly telling people about what God has done in her life. And that's it. That's what we're trying to do. We're, we, don't, we don't have to know all the theology. It's good for us to learn the Bible. We do all need to be growing in that, but we don't have to understand it all. You're never gonna understand it all. We have to share Jesus with people though. 
And so you may not be sharing and think, well, that's really difficult for me to do and that's really hard and I, I bet she's grown in it some, I'm sure that she has, and God will grow you in that too and it's gonna take some of us definitely more relying on the Holy Spirit than we ever have before, but we want you to do this. Last week, we turned in the names, uh, we turned in, we did our kind of first wave of turning in names uh, on these stickers. I meant to bring one up here with me and I didn't and I don't have one up here, but they're downstairs now and you fill out the sticker you put the first name and the last initial of the person you're gonna be praying for. And then we have a big one in the coffee house. You can't really miss it. And you put the sticker on the one. Last week, we had 147 stickers turned in. So it's very exciting. And there were a lot more names than that because you are really bad at following instructions. And some of you... <laughs> chose your seven and cho you know, it's like, who's your two? And no, it's like one, I'm kidding. You can have more than one. Uh, the point is to be intentional. But last week we started this and, and our goal again is to bring people to Christ. And you may get into February and already see that God has opened up opportunities for you to share Christ with this person and you do and they come to the Lord. And then the goal is that you have another new one now. Remember I said this a couple weeks ago, it's not that if your one you know, comes and, and you feel like they've taken the right step, then and now it's like, all right, well, I'm done for the year. Until next year, I get to take it off. No, now you get a new one, and it's us being intentional about reaching people for Christ. And so today, we're gonna read a story of a conversion that I think maybe one of the most powerful conversion stories we see, I think each, I don't know if you can argue that one's more powerful than the other, but just of somebody that is so far from God. I wanna share this story first. There's a guy named David Platt who wrote a book. He's written several books. Radical is one of them, phenomenal books. Uh, and a pastor I really look up to. And he wrote a book called Follow Me. And in that, he tells the story of a guy named Matthew who comes to know Jesus. Matthew grew up in a Muslim country and he, if you know much about Muslim countries, there are some that are very tolerant of Christians and some that are, if you profess Christ as your Lord and as Savior, they'll kill you for that. I mean, th that's just the reality of it. And Matthew came from one of those countries. And he told, his story goes that he said, whenever I came to Christ, I was told, write down everybody's name that you know that doesn't know Jesus. And he was like, that's everybody that I know. And so he wrote down everybody that he knew. And then they said, now circle the 10 on your list that are least likely to kill you if you tell them about Jesus. I mean, it's a true story. And probably for you, when you wrote your one down or when you're thinking about your one, because you haven't done it yet, but you're gonna go downstairs and do it today, you're not thinking, I wonder if they'll kill me if I share Christ with them. This is, not, this is not really a concern of ours. Probably our concern in this is more along the lines of, I wonder if I bring up Christ, will it be uncomfortable around them? Maybe the farthest that you'll go is, and I, and I had somebody share this with me this week, and I won't say who it was, but th they said, Taryn, I'm, I'm struggling because I, I know that the person that I'm supposed to reach out to uh, is far from God, they're a family member, and I think if I share Christ with them, it's, there's already a, a gap between me and my family because I follow Christ and they don't want anything to do with Christ. And if I share Christ, there's gonna be a bigger gap there. And I, they, she's like, I just don't know how to, to deal with that. And, but the, the incredible thing was, it wasn't a, I'm not going to do that. It's just, this is the thing that's ahead of me. And so today we're gonna hear a story about someone who, if you share Jesus with them, the consequences are severe. And just see what we can learn from their story. So we're gonna actually start in Acts chapter seven because this is the first time they're mentioned and then move to Acts chapter nine where really the story of his conversion is. And so this starts off with Stephen. That's not who we're talking about today, but Stephen, a disciple of Jesus, is sharing about Jesus, preaching about Jesus, and the Jewish leaders don't like it. The Jewish leaders were infuriated by Stephen's accusation and they shook their fists at him in rage. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily into heaven and saw the glory of God, and he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. And he told them, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. Then they put their hands over their ears and began shouting. That seems a little childish to me, I don't know. It's just, 
They rushed at him and dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. His accusers took off their coats and laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. Now, this is not super important to this story, but it's super important to the future story that Saul was there. And Luke, the the author of Acts, I believe knew this in writing it. As they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell to his knees shouting, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And with that, he died. So Saul is there in the middle of stoning a disciple of Jesus, a follower of Christ. The next chapter, we see the Ethiopian eunuch, which we talked about last week, who is somebody who is seeking after Jesus or seeking after an answer and just doesn't know what the answer is. And then we get to the story of Saul. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats. So this is the beginning of chapter nine, threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way. That's just what it was, the name of this following of Jesus, followers of the way, he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, he didn't discriminate, he wanted to bring all of them back to Jerusalem in chains. As he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked, and the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men with Saul stood speechless, for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but Saul, no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. I think this gave him a lot of time to think about his life and where he was and what's going on. Now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision calling Ananias. Yes, Lord, he responded. The Lord said, go over to Straight Street to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man named Tarsus, named Saul man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. But Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And he is authorized by the leading priest to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. But the Lord said, go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings as well as to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So in this story, we have Saul and Ananias, these two uh, very reluctant people, right? And coming from different places a little bit. I just want to look at both of them and what we can kind of learn from them. So from Saul, and if you're following along in the sermon notes, you can fill this out. Uh, Saul, first thing, he was nobody's one. Nobody was writing Saul down on a sticker and putting it on the one downstairs and thinking, I'm going after this guy. He's going to be my one. Can't wait to share Jesus with him. Hopefully he doesn't kill me. Hopefully he doesn't arrest me, right? Saul was nobody's one. Saul fought against everything that was Christ. Everything associated with Christ. Saul was a very religious man. He was a Pharisee among Pharisees, incredibly well-educated. He sat politically in a great spot because he's a Roman citizen and Rome was the powerhouse of the world. I mean, he was the perfect candidate to spread the gospel to the world. That's why God chose him and set him there and put him in a place. And he ends up writing more than half of the New Testament when he's later converted to Paul. But Saul at this moment had wanted nothing to do with Jesus. He had heard about the things Jesus had done. He had heard about the miracles. He had heard about things, but he knew Jesus was dead. And that's, uh, that's where he had a problem. In Acts 26, it's, uh, he says that Jesus told him that it was Saul, why are you kicking against the goads was the phrase. It's a metaphor, kicking against the goads. We don't use that today. A goad is a, a long stick, almost a spear that you would put behind oxen to get them to move in a direction. And 
if they stopped moving, they would get kind of stabbed with a little bit. And, you know, Peter would not like this, but they, that's what it was. And so you, they would stab him a little bit, and the oxen sometimes would kick back against it, but then they would catch their hooves on it or their legs, and they'd get cut up. And uh, it was, it's this idea of why are you fighting against the thing that you know is the right thing to do, what I want you to do. And he fought against it every way possible. And he was nobody's one. Nobody would have chosen him. And this gives us a glimpse. All I really want to talk about with Saul today is that this gives us a glimpse into that the person that we may have to reach out to, we may think is the least likely candidate for God to rescue, but maybe the most likely candidate, maybe the person that God has in mind for you to go after. Another thing about Saul is Saul is doing nothing to make himself more acceptable to Christ. There's not any, he, he's not trying to get his life together. He's not trying to, to, to do good things in his life. I mean, he's doing the things that he thinks are good. He's, he's wrong, I mean, in that. I read one commentary. I thought this was so well said. He compared, because in Acts 8, we talked about the Ethiopian eunuch who's riding in a chariot, reading from the prophet Isaiah, and he's trying to learn what the right answer is. And then in Acts 9, we have Saul who's going to kill Christians on his way to do that. And he compares these two, and it says, it is impossible for a man to be in a frame of mind less favorable to conversion to Christ than was Saul when he started on his mad expedition. How striking the contrast between him breathing out threatening and slaughter against the disciples of Christ as he started for a foreign city to arrest and imprison them and the eunuch. Look at the contrast between them. The eunuch reading thoughtfully the prophet Isaiah as he started on a peaceful journey to a distant home. Yet the gospel of Christ shows its wonderful power of adaptation by turning both into the way of salvation. See, sometimes we discredit people that God has not discredited. God does not write off people as quickly as we do. And, and so when we look at Saul, I just want us to, to look at those, the other Saul's around us this way. Saul also didn't get God's attention because he was doing anything good. And I think if we just realize this, we can realize that maybe God has a purpose for the person that I'm, I'm not sure about them and I'm not sure if they should be my one because of all the, you know, I know what they live. I know that they are so anti-Christ. They don't want anything to do with him. Um, and I just want our eyes to be open to this, that maybe that's exactly who God has in mind for us. Now let's look at the other reluctant person in this, Ananias. Ananias a little reluctant in a different way, right? Ananias, his first response is, yes, Lord. What a great response. You know, when Jesus tells you to do something, when the Holy Spirit prompts you to do something, our response should be, yes, Lord. No matter what, no matter where, no matter when, no matter how, in advance, my answer is yes. Some of us wish our spouses would do that, right? <laughs> my wife comes and is like, Taryn, can you do me a favor? And I'm like, I'm not gonna say yes, Lord, but you know, like yes, dear. <laughs> yes, dear, or something. Will you come do me a favor? And my response is usually like, ah, do I have to get up? Like, do I have to put my <laughs> shoes on? And you know, we're a little reluctant and our response probably should be yes, dear. For, our, for the Lord, it should be yes, Lord. And, and so the Lord came to him and Ananias, yes, Lord. I want you to do something. Yes, Lord. I want you to go to Straight Street. Yes, Lord. I know that one. Take a left on Main Street by the old Circle K or something. Uh, take, you know, go, to, yeah, go, to, go to Straight Street and to the house of Judas. Yes, Lord, I know him. Good person. Yeah, you're gonna meet a man there. Yes, Lord. His, he's from Tarsus. Yes, Lord. His name is Saul. Mm, wait a second, Lord. Um, so his second response was, are you sure, Lord? <laughs> now, that wasn't his actual response, but it was kind of, hey, Lord, do you know uh, you've been busy, and so I just want you to know down here, though, we're dealing with a situation, and it's this guy. Like, he's the situation, and that's who you want me to go and talk to. Are you sure about this? And I love God's response. It's Ananias is looking at his past, and the Lord looks at Paul's future. Ananias says, do you know what he's been doing? He's been killing Christians and arresting people, the believers down here, anybody who talks about you. And the Lord says, yeah, but I've got a big plan for him. 
He doesn't deny what he's done, but he looks towards the future of it. And then Ananias, I don't want to give him a hard time in this because he's showing a concern. We're, we're you know, showing concern to a heavenly father is okay. That, that, that is, that's good. But he's obedient. You know, it's, it's really easy to be obedient when it's something you want to do. Like if the Lord came to me, I was like, Taryn, I want you to take an afternoon nap today. Yes, Lord, I can do that. <laughs> for you. You know, like that's an easy thing to do. That doesn't require a lot of sacrifice. What requires sacrifice is when it's something we don't want to do. That's when true obedience shines through, right? It's when we're afraid. It's when we're fearful. It's when we think, I don't know what they're going to say, and I don't know what they're going to do, and our relationship might be ruined, and people at work might think I'm weird, and people might look down on me, and this may mess up this for me, and my family may look at me differently. Yes, Lord. I have all the concerns. I have all the challenges here. Yes, I'll do it. And, And we're yes anyways, because it's totally worth it. The outcomes of what, the the potential bads that could come, the potential harm that could come from sharing Jesus with somebody, don't even get anywhere close to the potential good that comes from them giving their life to Christ. Amen? We know this, we see this, but we're we're reluctant, right? So as we're, as we're looking at this, I just want to say, who do you, who do you kind of respond to in this? Who, do you, who can you align up with? Ananias, maybe you're the Ananias, a little reluctant there. Or maybe, maybe you're sitting in Saul's seat, and you're like, I've heard about some good things about God, but I'm just, I've met a lot of Christians, and I don't know about them, and reluctant in that way. So I just want to give you we're, just some expectations that I think we should have because I'm trying to set you up for this well, some expectations that we should have as we begin to share Christ with people. And number one, I think, is we should expect Saul to Paul stories all over the place. All over the place. We, we should see, we should expect to see Saul to Paul stories. Last year, as we were reading through the Bible, um, you know, the incredible thing about the Bible is you can read through it many, many times and you read through it and you find something new every single time and, and God speaks to you about something. And this was just such a verse for me <laughs> last year and has been this year. Psalm 5.3, I was so convicted reading this. It said, listen to my voice in the morning, Lord. Each morning I bring my request to you and wait expectantly. And I was so convicted in the, when I read this because I thought, each morning I bring my request to you. That's the end of it for me a lot of times. And I don't wait expectantly for the Lord to respond, but we should. If we're praying for people to come to know Christ, we should expect to see people coming to Christ. And we should wait expectantly. If we're saying, God, please open up conversations for me to have with this person, then we should be looking for those conversations. I wonder when that's gonna happen. Instead of waiting almost reluctantly or non-expectantly or like, I prayed that, but I don't know if that's gonna really happen or who knows, you know. Waiting expectantly and we should expect to see more and more people come to Christ. You know, my, my vision, what I want to see, I, I read this this morning from Acts 2.47, So I hadn't planned on this. I don't have this up here. Acts 2.47, it just talked about when the church started, it says, and each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. I was like, Lord, that's what I want. Not for my glory. I wanna see each day people being added to the fellowship of people being saved. I mean, wouldn't you love to see a baptism every week like Isaac said? We just never drain, out, drain the baptistry. Well, we'd have to because it'd get dirty and stuff, you know? But, but we would, we just, every week we would just know there's gonna be people giving their life to Christ. There's gonna be people putting them on in baptism. And so guess what? Another baptism, that will never get old. And so we should be expecting this. The other thing we should expect is that Jesus will chase everyone. I know we've said this with Paul or with Saul today. I call him Paul a lot because that's who he is now. We see this with Paul is that, Jesus will chase everyone, the people we don't expect. And we should begin to expect that he's gonna chase the people we don't expect. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. He's gonna go after the lost, all of them. It doesn't matter how they're acting, how they're behaving. Well, they drink too much, they party too much, they look at pornography too much, they do all that. Okay, come to Jesus anyways. Let him fix you, let him clean you up. We'll work on all those things. That's between you and the Lord. Come to Jesus and he will be chasing after them And the other thing we should expect is that you will be used and tested. Look at Ananias. 
He did not think he was going to be talking to Saul that day. He thought, like, today's going good. I had my morning coffee, and I don't know if they drink coffee. But, you know, and, and like, he, he just didn't know, and he was used and tested. But know that it's going to grow you, that you're going to find joy in it. And then look at what happened because of this. So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul. I love that. The first interaction with him is brother. Like, hey, I, I, I know your past. I know what you've done. But I know what Jesus is doing in you. And I'm already calling you a brother in Christ. The Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me so that you might regain, regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Afterward he ate some food and regained his strength. Now what a cool thing to be Ananias because you know Ananias doesn't get a lot of credit or isn't talked about. Nobody, should, nobody cares about credit, though. He's not talked about a lot in the Bible. But he impacted the person outside of Jesus, the person outside of Jesus that I would argue affected the church in the greatest way in the history of time, Paul. I mean, today, we, we read Paul, Paul's writings all the time. He, he wrote so much, went all over the world, shared the gospel all over the world at that time. But Ananias, you don't really hear a lot about Ananias, right? I mean, you hear a lot about Paul, but it took an Ananias to get to Paul. Max Lucado, who's written many, many books, has had a great impact on the world today with his Christian literature, said, my favorite Ananias-type story involves a couple of college roommates. The Ananias of the pair was a tolerant soul. He tolerated his friend's late-night drunkenness, his midnight throw-ups, sounds like a great roommate, and his all-day sleeping. He hung with his personal Saul, seeming to think that something good could happen if the guy could pull his life together. I distinctly remember Jesus knocking me off my perch and flipping on the light. It took four semesters, but Steve's example and Jesus' message finally got through to me. So if this story lifts your spirit, you might thank God for my Ananias, my dear friend, Steve Green. You never know how you will impact somebody's life. Our call is to be obedient to Jesus. Lord, use me in the way that you want me to be used. Yes, Lord, I've got, I'm reluctant in some ways, but I'm here for you. So I, I want you to think a bit about this as we close out today. We're going, about to go into a time of prayer and communion. Um, if you came in with some reluctancy in this, whether you're reluctant in sharing your faith with people like Ananias, I just want to encourage you in that, that God is with you. That whatever those fears are, that God goes before you in that. If you came in reluctant today because you relate a little more to Saul, you're not really sure about these Christians, you don't really like them that much, somebody invited you and promised you lunch afterwards, if they didn't, they should take you to lunch. I say that all the time. Um, but if, if that's you, Jesus loves you. He is coming after you. He desires that you would be saved and that you would know him.